Well, great to see you all. And uh, what follows are excerpts from an article. When, when Larry Goldman and I were uh, talking months and months ago about having a joint event and talking to Paul about it, doing the three, three institutions doing it together, I said, well, there's an, Bishop Dennis Madden the chairman of the Bishop's Committee on Ecumenical and Interreligious Affairs, he's going to write an article which should appear around the time of the week of prayer for Christian unity, and it's looking to the future. And that will be ideal to hang the talk on, and then I will give some comments. Well, that article has yet to appear, <laughs> but it is in process. And I was thinking... Uh, about this, and he and I talk every week uh, about these matters, and I also talk to uh, Father Ron Roberson and uh, Dr. Anthony Sorelli and, and the other members of our team, and some of these ideas, I don't know who started them. <laughs> they'll appear in an article and they'll appear tonight, and hopefully they'll be of some help to you. We thought we would begin, uh, if our technology is in good shape, uh, with a little video. Can we do this? Mm -hmm. See? Oh. Hello and welcome to the meeting. I'm Donna Crossman here to tell you about the week of prayer for Christian unity. Welcome, Father John. Well, glad to be here. Uh, the search for Christian unity is uh, rooted in prayer. And the premier uh, event or series of events actually is the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity, which is celebrated internationally. In the uh, Northern Hemisphere, it has to be celebrated in January from the 18th to the 25th of January. In the Southern Hemisphere, they tend to celebrate it in what for us is the summer around the Feast of uh, Pentecost. But the Week of Prayer goes back over 100 years. People have been praying for Christian Unity for quite a long time. And with obvious uh, results. Uh, this year we will uh, pray on the theme of what does God require of us. The theme is set by the Faith and Order Commission of the World Council of Churches working with the Vatican. And they ask it, a group in a particular country uh, to develop uh, materials for the week of prayer. This year the uh, country is India. And so there's some reference to that in the materials that are provided to people who are going to celebrate the eight days of the week of prayer. So what does God require of us in Christian unity? Well, what God requires of us is uh, to be responsive. Jesus prayed that his followers would be one at the last supper. And so he requires of us that we pray and work for Christian unity. But a particular emphasis this year coming out of uh, the folks in India, the Christians in India, is that we are to be conscious of those on the periphery, on the poor, the outcasts, those in the lowest caste. Each person is to be valued by Christians. It would seem as if uh, so that uh, if you wanted to live this theme, not only during the week, but also throughout the year, that various denominations could unite behind working to uh, work with our poor brothers and sisters, soup kitchens, etc. Right. The outflow, of course, you can pray the purchase of a variety of materials for each day that will be expended into weeks, months, or even throughout the year. But the idea is to be practical. So what can we do together to help those around us who are in need? How can we collaborate uh, to bring Christian unity to life in a positive way? One author once said that Christians together are the best advocates for those in need to provide the voice for the voice. With the hope of the Holy Spirit that's on that poster. Thank you very much, Father, for joining us to tell us about the week of prayer for Christian unity. And thank you for joining us for three minutes. See you next time. All right. All right. <laughs> Ellen keeps those the three minutes, too. And uh, what you did is the present and the future, what we just saw. So let me begin here by saying, where is the Holy Spirit leading us in the ecumenical movement? A new era is emerging. 
that will encompass the great gains of the five centuries or five decades of dialogue and lead us closer to full communion, to full communion with each other, which is Jesus' command and which is our goal. I'll be looking uh, tonight at emerging trends while remaining aware that unexpected interventions of the Holy Spirit are always possible. In some ways, I think we will be returning to the early history of the ecumenical movement. Both mission and the contributions of the laity are again coming to the fore. Our mission is to share the teaching of Jesus Christ with the world. This is gaining higher prominence, it seems to me, in ecumenical circles. We followers of Christ seek to share Christ's message of salvation with others. For Catholics, this missionary impulse is expressing itself in the new evangelization. The Catholic Church is inviting those who once walked with us, but have either, either taken a by road or ceased walking, we're inviting them to walk again. Before and during my time as director of the consortium, the seminaries and their sponsoring churches were, uh, were stressing identity. What it, it is to be Methodist, Episcopalian, Catholic, Lutheran, and so forth. This was in part a response to declining membership and to growing secularization around us, which uh, Tom, uh, Ryan mentioned this afternoon. For example, uh, just take a look. I was having this conversation a few days ago with a friend of mine who reads novels and short stories. And we came to some agreement that what they are often noted for today is the absence of God. People write as if God does not exist. I noticed this in reading a best-selling book that is about the death of the uh, daughter of a famous author. And she goes through a profound analysis of her response and her memory, but there's not a whole lot in the book, at least three quarters of the way through where I am, that speaks of faith. I mean, it's not against it. It's just not explored. And so we have the rise of kind of this secular absence of God. This was captured by Cardinal Koch, of the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity. He gave a talk in England, and he, he quoted an author who said, it used to be centuries ago, centuries ago, we thought of living for 40 or 45 years and then eternity. And nowadays, a lot of people think of living 90 years, and that's it. And so you got to get it all done while you're here, because there's no future. The effort to stress identity among the seminaries, I think, met with some success. But ultimately, we do not share Christ by looking inward, but by looking outward. Leaders as diverse as Pope Benedict and Rick Warren are stressing more the need to invite others to follow Christ. One of the groups following uh, this session here where uh, Dr. Grieve and I will speak, one of the smaller groups is the discussion of Catholics and Evangelicals and how is that going, our, our conversations, and what does that mean if, if people as diverse as the Pope and, uh, or former Pope, Pope Emeritus, and Rick Warren are kind of saying a lot of things that are uh, similar. The now retired Pope saw the uh, spiritual poverty of many people as a great challenge for Christians. How can we offer the message of Christ in a hope-filled and joyful and convincing way that will fill the spiritual va vacuum that exists in many people's lives and bring inner peace? An aspect of this uh, process is reconciliation. The Pope called Christians to self-examination and to repentance so that we could be more effective witnesses. 
he, quote, ecumenism and the new evangelization both require the dynamics of conversion, understood as a sincere desire to follow Christ and to adhere fully to the Father's will. Personal transformation is a prelude, personal transformation is the prelude to offering an invitation to others. We do have to know who we are, but we also have to reach out to share in some effective, gentle, and loving way our faith with others. We ourselves then have to go deeper spiritually. Visible unity will require a true and lasting reconciliation between Christian communities. That's where we are now. What about the relationships, as we spoke about earlier today, but then also what about the reconciliation? Perhaps the contemporary experience of communal reconciliation facilitated in several countries by groups such as the Catholic San Egidio community will help us with this process. San Egidio helped to broker the peace in Mozambique and has been consulted. They're, they come out of Italy, basically. Though so I understand somebody from San Egidio might be here tonight. And the fact is that the, the, there is something to be learned for what these communities, both Catholic and uh, Protestant, Orthodox, are doing to facilitate peace in the world, and can we learn from that to facilitate peace among the churches and reconciliation? There's been a lot of progress to a reconciliation. One example comes from the North American Orthodox Roman Catholic dialogue. The dialogue partners agreed to certain steps that would need to be taken to prepare for full communion between Orthodox and Catholic churches. This dialogue will be discussed in another of the small groups tonight. Most people are not aware of that, but there is a document out there that says, well, how can we come closer together and prepare for full communion, which of course is the work of the Spirit. The overarching question is how can we walk together and thus make and thus make our witness to Christ more credible. We're back at the original question of 1910 at the Edinburgh Conference, which many think kicked off the ecumenical movement. Or you might decide a contemporary example. If you read Sunday's New York Times, Russell Duthat, I'm never sure how to pronounce his last name, uh, he had an article and he said, uh, the new Pope, Pope Francis, is uh, time as uh, the Bishop of Rome will be successful or not, depending on whether the people in the Roman Catholic Church, the bishops, the priests, and everyone else, become more genuine. They follow what they preach. They have Christian character. And of course, here is an author in a uh, basically secular newspaper uh, who is, of course, a believer, but is saying that you have to be genuine. You have to live the message you're sharing with others or it doesn't make any sense. What can we say about difficult issues? There are, of course, some issues on which the Christian churches seem to be diverging rather than converging. These include questions of sexual morality. The formal ecumenical dialogues are finally beginning to address questions of personal morality. I say finally because uh, when Dr. Sandra Wheeler and I, many a decade ago, were going to teach a doctoral level course on uh, Christian ethics, moral theology, uh, we did a search on personal morality <laughs> agreements. Uh, there were, there's two major documents. Uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Root. Mike Root has uh, given an exhaustive analysis of all references and agreed statements to morality, but there's two major statements. There's a few others, uh, more recently, articles and the like, but there wasn't much. This is around 2002. There's been relatively little ecumenical discussion of these highly emotional questions. Now issues such as family disintegration, cohabitation, contraception, sterilization, and so forth are beginning to be discussed. Both the International Lutheran Roman Catholic Dialogue 
and the current Anglican Roman Catholic dialogue in the United States are working to identify the points of convergence and the lines of divergence in our understanding of personal morality. This is a beginning step. This is what you do at the beginning. So I think that we will need to work on these kind of questions for a decade or more. Things don't come easily. We've neglected these things for so long that it, and in some parts of the world they've caused us to grow apart. But of course not everywhere. Another thing I want to talk about, so I have two themes here basically. One theme is okay, uh, we are all seeking now more and more to, about spreading the gospel message. Not just establishing the identity of the community, but rather going a step further. You've got to know who you are in order to know what you're sharing, but, also, but that's not sufficient to be so inward focused. One needs an external focus. And of course, we know that it's most effective when we do that together. And the next question, of course, is who's going to do it? The Catholic Association of Diocesan, Ecumenical, and Interreligious Officers, of which Father Don Rooney is the current president, and the religious orders with ecumenical mission, they pro provide an educated cadre of ecumenical leaders, and they've done this for decades. However, the reality is this contribution is changing as the number of priests and religious diminish. Lay women and men played a significant role in the ecumenical movement from the beginning. After the formation of the National and World Councils of Churches, and later the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity, the ecumenical work tended more to be the work of church professionals. Now there's a swing back to lay participation and leadership, partially because the number of church professionals engaged in ecumenism in these various organizations is diminishing, often for financial reasons. And so we're confronted with a change. We have people who are interested. For example, the internationally prominent, predominantly lay, Catholic Focolare movement brings Christians of many churches together. The movement even has an ecumenical group of bishops that meets every summer. It's truly amazing how attractive the Focolare movement stress on our daily love for neighbor is for those who are searching. So I'm arguing there's a renewed emphasis on lay men and women and their role in the ecumenical movement, and also there are already lay movements, and not just Catholic ones out there that have a lot to teach us. Today we are seeing the gifts of the Spirit given to permanent deacons in the Catholic Church, and to laity, these are coming more to the fore. Catholic lay men and women continue to serve on diocesan ecumenical commissions and as parish ecumenical representatives. As we move toward the roles of these lay representatives, these roles will expand. Laity education in the basics of ecumenism will be serving dioceses in very relationship with our fellow Christians. So laity need to be educated in ecumenism to serve more effectively. What are these forms of training? To take an intelligent part in the work of ecumenism, learning is necessary. This learning has many dimensions. The Catholic certainly needs to know the basic ideas in the decree for ecumenism of the Second Vatican Council and on other documents. The Bishop's Committee uh, Secretary for Ecumenical and Interreligious Affairs, where I work, is beginning to develop new models of training local leaders. These models will be deeply rooted in our spiritual tradition. They will include readily available online videos, such as the one you just saw. So we have in process, we're doing, starting to do video, short informational pieces, three or four minutes, to provide some basic information. It's the place to begin, 
not the place to end. We envision integrated programs that will respond to the needs of all. The laity will, will, will include not only those who serve explicitly on ecumenical councils, but also people who could use explicit knowledge, such as those collaborating in social justice ministries or couples in ecumenical marriages. The point here is that we think there are people out there who are good-hearted and doing good things together for the community or together in their marital relationship, but their knowledge of ecumenism is fairly non-existent, but they would be a fertile group of people who could be gotten more involved and would have an interest in getting more involved because they're already ecumenically active because of their state in life and their numbers are huge. And they're pe people that actually are somewhat neglected because as I've talked to some of my Lutheran colleagues years ago, well, when they get a Lutheran Catholic couple, the minister's wanting the Catholic to become Lutheran and the Catholic priest is wanting the Lutheran to become Catholic, okay? So we get all this kind of com competition, but the reality is a little more complex. So we're trying to build integrated programs. Some recent work will advance education in ecumenism. A significant example is Cardinal Casper's book, Harvesting the Fruits, Aspects of Christian Faith and Ecumenical Dialogue, came out in 2009. Here the Cardinal brings together the results of 50 years of dialogue with major international partners, Anglicans, Lutherans, Methodists, and Reformed churches. This is in a concise and readable form. He synthesizes convergences in four major areas. This in, synthesis includes a very rich ch chapter on progress and understanding the church. Cardinal Casper also points to open questions and remaining differences. The Cardinal's achievement is echoing elsewhere. For example, Cardinal Kalk, who I mentioned earlier, he's Casper's successor, he called for what he calls a declaration on the way. Such a declaration would be a summary of the achievements of a bilateral dialogue between the Catholic Church and a partner community. The results of decades of common efforts to heal the wounds of past disagreement are now starting to be made available to a wider readership. Dr. Buddy mentioned a few publications that try to do this for a wider readership. Summary texts are starting to come forward. The reception of the results of dialogue will affect local community prayer and local discussions in unforeseeable ways. Of course, along with these emerging trends that I outlining two major things, the rising role of, uh, in the Catholic Church of laity and, and permanent deacons, and the rising role in all the churches of the evangelization efforts, these are a little bit new, but there's also a lot of community. Existing agreed statements will provide a foundation for continuing theological dialogue with ecumen of our ecumenical partners. For example, the agreed statement on baptism, recently approved by the United States Ca Conference of Catholic Bishops and the four Reformed Church partners, Presbyterian Church USA, Reformed Church in America, United Church of Christ and Christian Reformed Church. These partners in dialogue, we came to an agreed statement. We celebrated it in Austin, Texas uh, less than two months ago. This statement is being discussed, of course, in one of the small groups this evening. That is, there are things going on that affect the grassroots and, and are enable people to grasp the ecumenical movement in a practical way. And this is a development, I think, to be encouraged. And that is what we're seeking to do in our office, to encourage the further education of people in what has gone on, but make things available in a way. I always think of all those uh, volumes of agreed statements. And Michael Root's doctoral students read them. Or the doctoral students of some of the rest of you. But basically, most people don't have time to read them. So what we're doing is making things more available so the 
ordinary Christian or the educated Christian can come to a deeper realization of the importance of Christian unity. Finally, spiritual renewal will be always be at the center of the ecumenical movement. Again, this is one of tonight's topics that Dr. Brown will be leading a group on. The future will see less going our own way and more mutual discernment of God's will for all of us. We will all need to become more deeply rooted in prayer. We will need time for silence and for stillness. This is our time for listening to the Holy Spirit. We will need to listen attentively to our fellow Christians. To accept learning from others, of course, requires humility. We will become more like Jesus who humbled himself. Ultimately, the ecumenical movement will prosper, as we all know, if we become more like Christ. Thanks very much. I, uh, my, my topic is emerging trends in ecumenism, same, same topic. So I've taken the liberty of having a subtitle, um, which is a, a picture, a plethora of papers, practices, and pronouncements, and some puzzlements. That's my subtitle. Um, <clears throat> the picture comes from Dorotheus of Gaza, the 6th century founder of a monastery near Gaza, uh, somewhere around 540 CE. He wrote a book on the errors of Origen and Evagrius and wrote instructions for the monastic life. But his importance for this talk is an image, a picture he has given to us. Dorotheus was responding to someone who complained how hard it was to love both God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, do I focus on God to the exclusion of my neighbor or put my devotions to God on hold for the sake of serving my neighbor? The questioner had set up the problem as a zero-sum game. Dorotheus replied that this was not necessary, nor was it helpful. And here's the picture he gave to his interlocutor. Imagine a large circle and imagine that God dwells at the center of the large circle you are, you are imagining. You and I and all our neighbors are points along the circumference of the circle, all equidistant from the center of the circle. But as I move closer to the center, that is closer to God, or rather if I, as I am drawn by God's own power, own spirit, closer to God. And as you are another point on the circumference, are also drawn uh, more closely to God, we are simultaneously brought closer to each other as the circle grows smaller. So loving God brings us closer to the neighbor whom we love at God's command. Now, Dorotheus was focused on the double commandment and not on ecumenical dialogue and reception, but you can see right away, I'm sure, uh, why this image, this picture, was attractive to me in another context. Because as Father Crossan suggested towards the end of his remarks, if we become more like the Christ who humbled himself and died on the cross and rose again for us, we will also be become better listeners of one another. If we listen to that spirit that is drawing us to God, closer to God, we will also be listening better uh, to one another. The same spiritual practices that draw us closer to God will also draw us closer to our ecumenical neighbors in Christ. So the picture that serves as a challenge for us is a simple one. It's just a circle with a dot at its center. The plethora, the plethora of papers, practices, and pronouncements that make up emerging trends in ecumenism, I have to say a little bit more about. When Father Crossan asked me to give a paper on this topic, and I agreed because I like him, we've worked together on, on uh, at consortium events on, on poverty, and um, I like working with him on just about anything, so of course I said yes. 
And then I did what any self-respecting academic would do with a topic this huge and overwhelming and complex. I panicked. <laughs> but once I got that out of the way, I remembered that our seminary has a library. And a librarian who is more expert on matters ecumenical than I will ever be and who makes sure our ecumenical journals are kept current. So I spent a delightful morning poking around to see what's been said lately in ecumenical journals. And this is a report on some of the things I've found, this next section of my paper, which is probably not news to those of you who work in ecumenical studies and you read all these things and you're current um, on what's been said in the last couple of years in ecumenical journals, but this was not the case for me. And perhaps there's one other person in the room uh, who is not <laughs> totally current on ecumenical readings, and you can benefit from my ignorance as well. I had some catching up to do. Um, so I wanted, this is a report then on some of the things I found. So the next thing I need to do is to distinguish my report, which is sort of a phenomenological description of my time um, uh, looking through four or five journals um, for one morning from Mitzi, my colleague Mitzi Buddy's very carefully prepared, skillfully uh, targeted bibliography that you have in your possession. Uh, so that's the one, that's the real one. You want to take that one with you. Um, but this is just a kind of a, a godly play, a kind of a, a playful um, invitation to just sort of um, open journals with me for a while and see what you find. I found um, in Ecclesiology um, a Methodist author, David Chapman's article, Consensus and Difference, the Elusive Nature of Ecumenical Agreement from 2012. Um, in Ecumenical Trends, an article by Stephen Kuhl of Cardinal Stritch University in Milwaukee, revisiting the definition of the project. Being one as the father and son are one, John's answer to the question, what is the nature of the unity we seek? Back to the roots, back to Ad Fontes. And also in Ecumenical Trends, another one by Thomas Rausch, a professor of Catholic theology at Loyola Marymount in LA. Where is ecumenism today? Uh, Fred Hiltz, the Archbishop of the Anglican Church of Canada, uh, gave a Paul Watson lecture at Halifax entitled Holiness, Hospitality, and Hope in an ecumenical series, lecture series. Um, and then I found lots of articles and sermons in preparation for the week of prayer for Christian unity. In all of these writings, ecumenical theologians were revisiting the task, sharpening the focus, warning about paths that seemed less profitable, urging practices and perspectives that would move the conversation ahead. I also found lots of articles that combined an interest in ecumenism with other topics, such as Christians in the Middle East, the role of women in various cultures, ecumenism and globalization, an ecumenical framework for thinking about justice issues or issues in human sexuality, ecumenism and theological education, Christian identity and the other, Migrant theology and ecumenism, ecumenism and the environment, greening churches as a shared ecumenical practice, ecumenism and the problem of suffering, a, a problem that we share in common. I describe this category of articles, and there are many more, this is just a, you know, a sampling, as explorations of fresh ways to look at perennial questions that are assisted by putting on ecumenical lenses, questions that become um, more sharply focused by thinking about them with others from different traditions. Not surprisingly, ecumenically concerned Christians are also interested in interfaith conversations. So the question of Christians in the Holy Land, Christians in Egypt, Christians in Syria, in dialogue with Islam, uh, becomes important, and I found um, work on that. And I found an article by Katharini, um, I'm going to butcher her name, Salam Puni of the School of Social and Pastoral Theology at Aristotle University in Thessaloniki, Greece, giving an orthodox theological perspective on election and the people of God. 
and a document on the third cons of the third consultation of the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue, the World Council of Churches, and the World Evangelical Alliance on Christian Witness in a Multi-Religious World, Recommendations for Conduct from uh, March of 2012. Um, thinking, so how do we think ecumenically about Christian witness um, in a, in a multi-faith, multi-religious world? Faith and non-faith, I guess that's why they picked multi-religious. Of course a great deal, mo and uh, the great bulk of the articles I found uh, were in the area of ecumenical reception, various different kinds of reception. Thomas Green, professor of canon law at Catholic U uh, here, has written a, an article entitled A Canonist Perspective on Harvesting the Fruits. Uh, you already heard um, um, Father Crossan talk about Walter Casper's, uh, Cardinal, sorry, excuse me, Cardinal Walter Casper's important book, his reflections on various ecumenical dialogues and uh, uh, the state that they had reached. Um, I found Dr. Michael Root's comments on the hope of eternal life, recent uh, uh, U.S. Catholic and Lutheran dialogue on eschatology. And Mark Powell's book, uh, Papal Infallibility, a Protestant Evaluation of an Ecumenical Issue, um, was reviewed in several of the journals I consulted. Also, Susan Wood's important study, One Baptism, Ecumenical Implications of the Doctrine of Baptism. One of our conversations groups following this, this, uh, these talks takes up uh, the issues around baptism, um, not just in the, in the dialogue, but um, the future conversations. And I should mention um, reviews of John Zizula's book, The Eucharistic Communion and the World, uh, which brings together important conversations in ecumenism and liturgical theology. And Wolfgang Vandy, is that how you say his name? Vandy? Okay. Um, has edited a collection of essays entitled Pentecostalism and Christian Unity, Ecumenical Documents and Critical Assessments in 2010, reflecting another important trend in ecumenism that I found um, evidenced by articles, and that is the engagement of Pentecostal Christianity with multiple ecumenical partners, especially around issues of healing and sacraments. Paul Avis of the Church of England, Anglican, has recently written a helpful article reviewing three important books on Methodist studies, Oxford Handbook of Methodist Studies, Cambridge Companion to John Wesley, and TNT Clark Companion to Methodism, and asks in his article, Anglicans and Methodists on the cusp of unity? Um, it's in the latest issue of Ecclesiology, if you want to find it. In the same issue, comments and evaluation from the Eastern Churches Committee of the Diocese of New York of the Episcopal Church to the Church of the Triune God, an important Anglican Orthodox dialogue um, that concluded its first phase in Cyprus at Cyprus in 2006 and continues now in a second phase. But the importance of that document, it, it can, well, that document continues to be received and, um, and continues to provoke conversation. I, I began to think uh, also about the reception of practices, particularly when, when I hit T. Padam's article towards a common understanding of diaconal ministry, recent developments in the diaconate among the Porvu churches, and Stephen McMichael um, of the Department of Theology at the University of St. Paul in St. Paul, Minnesota, how the spirit of Claire and Francis continues to influence peace in our world that's in ecumenical trends, um, that may have new relevance in, in the area of reception with the arrival of a pope named Francis. But reception of people, reception of saints, reception of Francis and Claire, um, I, I hadn't really thought about that area of reception. There's an entire issue of ecclesiology dedicated to the discussion of former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, as an ecumenical theologian, but also on the special ministry and particular pressures of all church leaders, especially denominational representatives who speak in public forums on uh, ecumenical issues. Jeffrey Wainwright and others have been reflecting on the reception of the revised common lectionary. What happens to us ecumenically 
when we engage in the practices of reading the scriptures together. Jeffrey Gross, a name already mentioned earlier today by my colleague Mitzi Buddy, has written an article called Reception, the First Three Decades, the Contribution of Cardinal Bernadine in Ecumenical Trends um, last year. Um, so again, the importance of particular people in key places uh, making it a, a, a difference. This and many other articles I found signal the continuing importance of the reception of Vatican II. Uh, of course, the 50th anniversary of, of this has been widely celebrated. And we've already mentioned, hot off the press, is the convergence document from the World uh, Council of Churches, the church towards a common vision, ready to be received. I hope this admittedly scattershot approach, um, what a non-specialist in ecumenism could discover in a few hours in the library, will give you a sense or a sampling of the multiplicity of events and conversations and practices that, that make up what I've called a plethora of ecumenical emerging trends. So finally, my third part, a few puzzlements. The first, what do we know about the new pope, Francis I, on the subjects of ecumenism and ecumenical conversations, ecumenical theology? I'm hoping for some papal intelligence from this intelligent body. So I hope in the Q&A uh, to be enlightened uh, on, this, on this area. What do we know about uh, his commitments and presuppositions? The second question how can we expedite the process of ecumenical reception? And this is something that, um, again, um, Mitzi Buddy and I were talking about. This is really probably her idea more than mine. For example, is the agreed statement on baptism something that others of us who are not either Reformed or Roman Catholic, is it something that we could sign on to also as the Methodists did to the Joint Declaration on the doctrine of justification, um, Lutheran uh, Roman Catholic dialogue a few years after it came out in 2001. Father Crossan modestly failed to mention that he was present at the Austin, Texas uh, celebration of that work, uh, which gives him a special interest in it. But I think we're all watching um, ex ex an event that exciting. Um, and it would be interesting to think more about how instead of reinventing the wheel in all of our ecumenical dialogues, the bi bilateral dialogues, or trilateral dialogues when they happen, um, how we could think more creatively about sharing the fruit of um, harvesting the fruits, uh, to coin a phrase, of all those wonderful dialogues. Um, and then the next question picks up on um, some, some of um, um, Mitzi Buddy's comments about the approach of 2017. As we approach 500 years of the beginning of the Reformation, how can those of us who care deeply about these things, and especially those of us who are in theological education, reframe our teaching, our preaching, our um, being with people as they um, approach this time, to anticipate the sorts of confusions that may arise. And here I'm going to quote um, the uh, first paragraph of a paper um, that, that my colleague Mitzi Buddy just read recently in January at the John Leland Center. Um, her paper is called Horizon and Hope, Promising Developments in Christian Unity. And you really ought to hit her up for a copy. But here's a, first, a tantalizing first paragraph. She says, a few years ago, I was invited to be a guest lecturer on the ecumenical agreements of my denomination, which is a Lutheran, for a class at one of the Lutheran seminaries. As I taught the class, it became clear to me that the students were well informed about the Reformation divisions of the church, so much so that they became quite concerned to realize that their church had entered into ecumenical agreements with some of the modern-day denominational descendants of those divisions. Finally, I said to them, you're talking about the Reformation as if it were yesterday. One of the students responded, for us it is like yesterday. We just finished the course two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> 
She says, at that moment, I realized that they had internalized the 16th century divisions of Christianity for themselves as a key component of their identity, as a norm whereby they, as future clergy, would measure others both inside and outside the church. And they knew nothing about the achievements of this past century of ecumenical progress based on deep theological dialogue. <clears throat> Thank you, Mitzi, for that well-described well, uh, situation. I think those of us who teach find that, that seminary students are often at a place where their denominational loyalty has never been higher. They're in the process of, of uh, seeking um, ordination. There's nothing wrong with denominational loyalty. But when it's defined over against, or when um, denominations are, are um, people within a denomination are defining themselves by what they're not, um, that I, th I think is more problematic. And then finally, last but not at all least, the question with which Father Crossan began his remarks, the more general question, what is the Holy Spirit up to? How can we discern where the Holy Spirit is leading us in the ecumenical movement? My own hunch, as you may have guessed, is that as the Spirit draws us closer to God in Jesus Christ, we will also discover that we have been drawn closer to our ecumenical neighbors. Thank you very much.